All right, everyone. It is 12 o'clock here in Boston, and we'd love to get started with our webinar. So today we're going to be talking to Jack Levine from Town to Table, who's also located here in Boston, Massachusetts. And during the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be talking to him all about how he took uh, his college thesis and transformed it into a really interesting and successful farming career. So just to start off with some introductions, my name is Rebecca. I'm joining from Freight Farms today. And on the other line, we have Jack. Jack, do you want to just say hi so we can make sure your audio is working correctly? Sure. Um, hi there. My name is Jack Levine, as Rebecca introduced me. Um, I'm co-founder and CEO at Town to Table. And our mission here is to provide equitable access to innovative technology and healthy local food. I'm really excited to be chatting about our journey with Freight Farms today. Thank you so much for joining Jack and we're gonna get really into all of the awesome things you're doing at Town to Table. Just to quickly go over our agenda for today, as you can see it on the screen, we're really gonna be talking about how Jack went from finding a freight farm on his college campus to turning that into a really thriving career as a farmer and kind of the way that Town to Table is driving impact for more young people in the future. And uh, most importantly, we're gonna end with an audience Q&A. So if you look to the right side of your screen, screen you can see a Q&A panel as part of the GoToWebinar platform. Please feel free to send us any questions you have for either Freight Farms or Jack throughout the webinar, and we will answer those in about a 10 minute Q&A at the very end of the webinar. Um, and just so you know, this webinar is being recorded, so if for any point you can't participate for, for any reason you can't participate for the whole time, you can find the full recording on our website afterwards. All right, getting right into it. I want to talk to you, Jack, a little bit about, uh, you know, your experience with farming even before you attended college. So. Did you ever have growing up any interest or experience in farming or sustainability, entrepreneurship, anything like that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, growing up, I, I grew up just outside of Boston um, in a pretty urban setting. So I didn't have much experience um, farming or I, I really was never exposed to hydroponics. Um, I had very minimal experience, you know, gardening my backyard with my family, but really nothing past that. Got it. And as you were finishing up high school and thinking about college, what kind of career did you have in mind or what kind of passions were you interested in pursuing? Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if we want to date that, date that back to when I was a little kid, I, you know, wanted to be, you know, an NBA basketball player. Um, but as <laughs> I got older, you know, graduating high school, I, I really didn't have a clear direction. Um, and I was really going to Clark because um they they offer a lot of different different subjects and and they were pretty open to letting students find their interest um so i i went in as an undecided major um and luckily you know found something that really piqued my interest yeah and what did you end up studying while you were at clark sure so i was a geography major um with a minor in philosophy um and oh, wow. for that's a cool combination a lot of people <laughs> thank you um, a lot of people think, you know, geography major means that I know uh, every capital, which honestly I may not. Um, <laughs> but I really studied more focused around the intersection between humans and the natural world and how our society impacts the environment, which was a pretty natural fit for, you know, freight farm, particularly in an urban setting and how that can, there, there are a lot of parallels yeah. to, to what we're studying. Definitely. I can, I can see how, uh, that ties in really neatly with what you were studying. And did you discover the farm as part of your classes or did you find it a different way on campus? Yeah, so so being you know from around Boston, um, I was exposed to the to the idea um, and, I, and I heard of the concept, but I'd never you know been in a farm or, or seen a freight farm before Clark. Um, mm -hmm. And really one day I saw it on campus. You can see the picture down here. And, I knocked on the door and the head farmer, uh, Nick Pagan was in there and he told me, you know, we need an intern. Um, and actually within, within about a week, I was working in, as an intern for three to four days a week. Um, and, you know, oh, wow. it was something that grew into, 
you know, something that bigger than I ever had imagined. Um, but initially it was just really exciting to be involved on something on campus. Yeah. And was it just kind of the novelty of the technology that got you interested or was there anything else that inspired you? Yeah. So I, I would say the tech was probably the first thing that struck me. Um, you know, anyone mm -hmm. who's been in a car can probably speak to that, that it's a pretty visually striking um, thing to walk into. And, you know, yeah. I, I kind of looked around and said to myself, I want to learn how to operate this. So that's kind of what got me to stick, stick with it. Yeah. And so you mentioned that you got involved as an intern uh, at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So how was that, how was that managed by the school? Um, because for those of you who aren't familiar with the Clark project, it's actually kind of co-managed by the university and Sodexo. So how, how did they handle kind of the hiring of the intern? Yeah. So the intern position um, is through sustainable Clark. Um, and mm -hmm. they typically hire an undergraduate um, to kind of learn from the head farmer. And yeah. so that's where, where I started was as the intern for about six months, my sophomore year. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I went abroad to Costa Rica where I had a really amazing opportunity to live on an organic farm, which just, you know, deepened my interest in agriculture. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> it was really, really great. I don't know if yeah, I'd come back from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the freight farm brought me I back, right? Say. So. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And so then the after. Oh, no, go ahead, please. Uh, just to continue, you know, so once I got back, um, come my junior year, I became the head farmer for campus, which mm -hmm. really included all operations of a freight farm from, you know, seeding to harvest, cleaning, maintenance, but also kind of passed that as community tours, classroom sessions, helping to part, you know, work with Sodexo to market. Uh, the freight farm and to bring out people outside of Clark into it, um, which was That's really, really a valuable awesome. experience for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, that was actually like a job, right? The head farmer position as opposed to yeah. an internship. Yes. So I, I yeah. graduated from the intern into a, uh, into a job for the last two years of my college experience. Nice. And you mentioned kind of a few things that fell under the umbrella of head farmer. What, which did you find the most rewarding? Uh, as you were still on campus? Sure. Um, you know, to me, I seeing the impact that it had on the Clark community and the local Worcester community, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was really, really rewarding for me. And I, I like to tell a story where, you know, I had friends who may not have been big vegetable eaters um, and, you know, yeah. they would always eat the food that I grew and they would fill up their bowls with lettuce and stare at me while eating it. And it was, you know, funny and a joke, but it got <laughs> to the point where I would, be asked like, hey, are you doing a kale harvest today? And it's from someone who before this never ate kale. Um, and so that was really, really rewarding. And it kind of helped us lay the framework framework for Town to Table of seeing how this can positively impact community. Um, and we're looking to help more communities access this type of technology. That's amazing. I love, I love that story so much because it just shows like, we always talk about the power of knowing your farmer. And that to me is just, the perfect illustration of like when you actually know the person who's growing your food, you're like, oh, I should check out what Jack's growing and maybe take a taste. And and you're so much more connected to that food than you would be if it was just coming from an unknown source. That's amazing. For sure. Yeah. And, and for us, you know, for our community, it was, it was pretty empowering, particularly being, you know, in, in Worcester, which for those of you who don't know, is, in, is a city um, and there's not great access to uh, fresh food particularly year round. Mm -hmm. So being in the middle of the city, doing this type of farming was, was really, really rewarding. Awesome. So thinking about um, kind of that transitional moment between college and you actually starting town to table, um, you actually wrote the initial business plan for town to table as a second semester senior. Can you explain a little bit uh, that assignment and how it came to be? Sure. Yeah. So I'll rewind a little bit. Um, so because I was working in the farm between 20 and 30 hours a week, uh, Clark told me if you find a professor to sponsor you, it can count as a course. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I searched for a professor at Clark who could work with me to kind of write a, a feasibility plan, which I did my first semester and then a business plan, which mm -hmm. we did our second semester. Um, and, and I was really, really lucky to have 
a professor, an adjunct professor who runs his own business. Um, his name is David Jordan. So he's the president of Seven Hills Foundation. And, and he and I worked really closely to kind of craft our business plan and, and mold it into something that can be, you know, environmentally sustainable, but also financially sustainable. Um, and mm -hmm. at the same time, when I was doing this directed study to the entrepreneurship department, um, the intern at the time in the farm, her name is Kelsey Perry, and she did a nutrient uptake experiment through the biology department. And for me, this really showed me, you know, firsthand how interdisciplinary a freight farm can be and how many different subjects mm -hmm. it can hit on, um, which yeah. again, kind of helped us build the framework that this is something that, you know, more students need to be exposed to at a younger age. And, and that kind of led to, to our business plan. Yeah, and it really seems like between you and uh, Kelsey, it's like you both worked on the same platform and were able to take very different things out of it. I think that's really cool just to see how, you know, one experience inspired this very biology science interest and the other is more of an entrepreneurial interest. That's really cool. Um, so you mentioned David Jordan and Seven Hills. What What is Seven Hills? Can you just explain a little bit more because they play such a formative role in Township Table? Jack, you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I lost you for a second. It's okay. Yeah. Um, so, so Seven Hills um, is based in Massachusetts, and they're one of the largest health and human service organizations in the Commonwealth. Um, so they support mm -hmm. over 45,000 individuals um, across New England and also in eight developing nations. And they mainly work with children and adults um, with significant challenges, whether that be mm -hmm. poverty, autism, brain injury, intellectual and developmental disability, substance abuse. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, David Jordan, who was, who was a mentor to me, um, is the president over there. And so he and I actually, the, the initial plan before um, Town to Table was a reality was for me to work for them. And, and it was a really amazing opportunity. And I was very grateful for them to kind of off, offer me that where it was going to mm -hmm. be my first full-time job after school. Um, and actually, David and I had a, had a very a, a pivotal moment in Town to Table's development was he and I actually sat in the library at Clark together. I have a really distinct memory of me telling him, you know, something that I may want to pursue with my brother and best friend um, and kind of mm -hmm. launch Town to Table rather than, you know, working with him. And I was very nervous. You know, I didn't quite know how he would react. And he like almost jumped out of his chair and said, basically, you have to do that. Um, and then the next part of our conversation was ways that Seven Hills can still work with us as an outside consultant. And that, you know, for me, really, really gave me the confidence to take the leap, knowing that A, I had his support, but that B, he believed in it enough to do a project with us. Mm -hmm. um, so that really, really was a pivotal moment for us and something that, you know, looking back, um, kind of helped form our direction. Yeah, I, I mean, especially someone that I think has himself been very successful to just have that instant recognition of what you're trying to do and support um, must have really been like a lightning lightning bolt through you, just firing you up even more about what you were doing. For sure, yeah. I, I remember calling, you know, my friends and, and family and, and saying, you know, this is what we're going to do now um, with, you know, no, no reservations anymore and no questioning if it was going to happen. It was kind of after that day, it was going to happen. Yeah. And also, I mean, you know, not every 22 year old who's graduating college, you know, like it's honestly really brave to um, set out right away and create your own business, um, especially like starting with uh, your brother and your friend who are all kind of young and um, having kind of that that older, wiser person being like, yes, you can do it is it's such a big step in just justifying it. Yeah, for sure. And as we've, you know, as we've launched and, and got going with this, they've continued to be, you know, a great support for us, whether it be working together or even just a resource, you know, when questions about how to model our business or how to, you know, run a certain service line, they're always there for a resource mm -hmm. for us and, and have been a really great partner. And we actually kind of yeah. a, a side note, but we, we recently did a uh, remote learning session with about 40 uh, of their participants and families 
uh, and kind of showed them our freight farm um, from a distance, which was really nice. That sounds wonderful. Um, and obviously very, very cool that you can even pivot now with kind of everything being digital and online and still be able to connect with them. Yeah, and sure. you talk, yeah, you talk about this person as a resource, but I'm curious, like, how did your experience of actually having operated a farm for, you know, over two years at that point help you with building your business plan? Because, you know, a lot of, a lot of other people that want to pursue freight farming don't have that resource of just their own personal experience. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm extremely lucky and grateful that I was able to have that experience. And it, it really, you know, interestingly for us, the farm is something that, you know, we're most comfortable with where, you know, we, we can, before we ever got in it, we could project the yields. We were pretty comfortable with what type of schedule we would be in. You know, I, had experience training a number of different interns at Clark. So training my partners was, you know, something that was pretty natural. Um, mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you know, what part of, I was working very closely with Sodexo at the time. Um, and that, you know, they're mm -hmm. one of the largest food service organizations in the world. And it was a really amazing opportunity to see behind the scenes of how, you know, they would use a freight farm as a community engagement tool, but also pass that on, you know, how they, even simple things were how they, ordered food and how they got food delivered to the school. And I got to really see that firsthand. And those are all the parts of the mm -hmm. business that, you know, I, I don't have, I didn't have much experience with. Um, so seeing that was really valuable and, and it helped us kind of frame how we were going to be delivering to schools or restaurants or organizations in that way. Yeah. That seems like a really huge leg up uh, as you went out on your own to have had that um, just the ability to, sit and learn and internalize a lot of things before having to apply them to your own business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, on top of the business plan, you also did a feasibility plan. Uh, can you just explain a little bit what went into that? Yeah. Um, so it was basically like a precursor to a business plan. Um, and it mm -hmm. was really just to, you know, see if something like this, you know, was feasible or realistic in our area. And really, you know, zoning mm -hmm. in and, and seeing you know, who we might be trying to sell food to, who we might be trying to partner with for educational projects, and are these people looking to do that with us? Mm -hmm. um, and being, you know, lucky for me, like, you know, working in that freight farm, I had a number of different organizations in Worcester contact me because they wanted to be involved, um, and they were looking mm -hmm. to do projects on their own, which, you know, again, kind of led us to believe that that was feasible and that people are looking to do projects like this. And if we're a group that can help support uh, organizations or communities launch these projects, it's something we, we really want to do. Yeah. And I'm sure that later when you've, when you had graduated and decided to start Town to Table, that that feasibility plan and the business plan were probably really helpful in you getting financing. Can you talk a little For bit sure. about how you went about doing that? Yeah. Um, so actually, I, I, we received um, financing through uh, a partner from Freight Farms, um, Farm Credit East, and there we, we found a nice program with them where they're actually incentivizing uh, new young farmers, uh, particularly in areas that aren't growing food year round. So we were able to develop a really nice relationship with them where we're, you know, a young team and we're growing food in New England. Um, and then on top of that, yes, yeah, so we actually we brought out our relation, our the group over there to a freight farm. They took a tour of the Clark farm. Um, and they, you know, obviously looked at our business plan and, and having wrote that with the help of, of college professors was, was really key and, and helpful for us to build a relationship with our bank. Mm -hmm. That's great. So now, you know, you have the plan, you have the money, you're ready to start town to table. Uh, you mentioned this briefly when you introduced yourself, and I think you've kind of alluded to it throughout, but I really want to emphasize that, you know, town to table is not your typical retail uh, operation. Um, what is the actual mission that you have in that you have with the company? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're really looking to provide um, equitable access to healthy food, but also to innovative technology, where to us, you know, this is you know, the ground floor of an industry. Um, and and mm -hmm. we think that there should be an equal opportunity to get into that industry. 
and so yeah. for us you know partnering with with organizations that um serve a lot of different people is a way to do that yeah absolutely and you through Touch table you have what you call two service lines um, which are farm to you and kind of an educational program can you explain what those are and how they serve some slightly different needs yeah for sure so you know as it says on the screen they, they're separate but they're complementary and there's a fair fair share of intersection between them um, but our mm -hmm. farm to you program is mainly using freight farms to grow a commercial size amount of food um, and, and we partner with organizations to basically offer them you know contracted weekly deliveries um, and at the same time we you know have some collaboration in what we grow and you know some some customization within what the freight farm can grow mm -hmm. um, and so that's the farm to you program where we basically bring a freight farm's worth of produce to you each week um, and, and this has been a pretty natural fit for you know some schools educational spaces uh, restaurants and more wholesale distributors in the area mm -hmm. and then at the same time on a, on a smaller scale our educational program introduces um, hydroponic gardens into community spaces residential spaces schools uh, educational spaces and the goal there is to promote health and wellness through hands-on learning and so what we do is we we built we've built a number of different curriculums that are designed to be interactive, um, provide lesson plans and activities for students. And then on top of that, um, we go in and we provide training for staff and program leaders and teach them mm -hmm. on how, you know, all garden operations. And so the operation isn't really something that is thought about too much. And it's more focused around, you know, leading a interactive um, skills building program. And then the last thing we do is, is we provide support. Um, so we're you know, ongoing operational support with the gardens, but also curriculum iteration. And we do virtual office hours where we can check in on gardens virtually and also, you know, talk to some some students that way and show them our farm and, and whatnot. Yeah, so it sounds like to me, it it's kind of like a building block system. So based on what the customer wants, they can kind of add different components. So if they want, really fresh greens for their cafeteria they get the farm to you but then they can also layer in a garden or layer in support based on their needs yeah exactly and, and you know the farm it would be is, is owned and operated by us and then mm -hmm. we partner with with the organization for them to really uh, gain all the benefits the food but also programming through it um, yeah. And, and as you said, you know, it, it's kind of something we can be flexible with and do small scale programs with just one garden, you know, cafeteria mm -hmm. gardens where there's six all the way up to a freight farm. Um, and yeah. something that, you know, we did at Clark, which was received really well, is that we had a freight farm in the parking lot. But then at the same time, we had a smaller scale garden in the cafeteria uh, as an example mm -hmm. of what we were doing. And we found that that's a pretty nice, nice project to do with people because, you know, it, it shows on a small scale what we're doing and then you can use it as an example for, for the larger project that's going on. Yeah, that's I think that's a really great approach. Um, and you mentioned flexibility, which I think is key, especially, you know, Tantra Table is still relatively young as a company. So staying flexible, I think, is a great way to find your niche and see really what works um, as you do expand. And I'm just curious, how how close is the actual town to table business to the business plan that you wrote um, back in school? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there are parts of it that honestly I haven't touched and they're almost the mm -hmm. exact same. And then there are parts that yeah. you know we've we've had to you know we've adjusted um, just kind of learning the land the lay of the landscape. Um, you know for example we, we have curriculum that's designed to fit into like standard science classes. STEM, STEAM curriculums, um, but at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, we found that there's there's a lot of standards and regulations that state requirements that students have to hit and teachers have to be kind of on that schedule. Um, and, and we found a really nice reception from classrooms that maybe have some more flexibility and are more designed to build skills. So an example is like a culinary education classroom, you know, or mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're gonna be introducing programs into high school special needs classrooms come September. Um, and in those classrooms, 
for us are really cool because we can really focus our program on building transferable skills that can lead towards you know volunteer or community-based work opportunities um, and, and that's a big big goal for our program there absolutely and what what kind of uh, community partners are you already working with sure so we, we work with um, like an, some nonprofits we work with school local schools in the area um, we actually mm -hmm. recently have been working with a wholesale distributor um, and, and we've had some really you know nice conversations with some local restaurants um, in the area and that's actually an area that we're looking to expand on a little bit nice and I'm curious because obviously when it comes to pitching just the produce in the farm it's fresh it's healthy it's local it's sustainable but i'm curious what kind of other value do you layer in when you're pitching the more educational components sure yeah i mean you, you pretty much nailed it about the farm you know fresh local uh we harvest and bring it to you within 24 hours but the mm -hmm. educational model you know is more for us about you know being exposing people to this really innovative technology um that yeah. can you know build skills towards jobs you know in the sustainable food sector and at the same time you know we we think that learning about these concepts uh can lead towards students having more of an interest in environmental issues and you know hopefully become sustainability advocates as they move on from their from their hometown is, is a big goal of ours yeah and i'm sure that especially for you know high schools colleges like that sustainability piece is probably really key. I think that's a really big trend in education in general is just focusing in more on inspiring a sustainability mindset from a young age. For sure, yeah. And we think, you know, food is a, is a really great example of that um, and can be used, you know, as an example for our whole um, society and even our environmental issues that we're going through right now. Yeah, I mean, food is just so relatable. I feel like it's such a equal platform of reference for everyone um, to like really understand the the difference from a sustainability perspective. Yeah, for sure. And I'm curious, just even anecdotally, like what kind of reactions have you gotten from teachers, students, um, other participants in these programs? Yeah, honestly, people are really, really excited. Um, you mm -hmm. know, our, our program is designed to be therapeutic. Um, particularly in some of our educational spaces that work with uh, adults and students with disabilities. But at the same time, we've had a really interesting um, reception from program leaders who have said to us, you know, that they find it therapeutic as well, as, you know, a, oh, a place to step lovely. away and, and have a great indoor green space where, you know, it, it, it's always there, it's always green, and having that mm -hmm. in a setting can be therapeutic for anyone. Um, so we've had really yeah. great reception from you know program participants but also program leaders that way that's great and i think that that ties in really well into this idea of impact and i think that time to table really fits into this kind of cycle of impact because you arrived on campus and you were inspired by your farm and there's kind of this feeling that time to table is paying it forward in a way um is that something that's kind of a motivating piece of Town to Table and what you're doing? It is, yeah. I do like to use myself as an example um, where, you know, I, I, I'd had a hard time sitting still in classrooms. Um, and when I got in the freight farm, they told me, this is a class for you and I'm on my feet, I'm learning, I'm, I'm learning by doing. And, and for me, it was a you know, really, really formidable experience um, through my education. And it's something that we want to provide access to a wider audience. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think it has to take somebody until they get to college to see this type of stuff. And we want mm -hmm. students, you know, leave, like leaving their hometowns and going to their college and either A, there's a, you know, a freight farm or a gardening program that they can be a leader in, or B, they can say yeah. to their school, why don't you have this? I think we should be doing stuff like this. And that's, you know, kind of the advocacy part of it. Yeah. And I mean, I think you're also an awesome example of how having that exposure can create um, kind of this interest in farming after school and um, if not farming, just, you know, being involved with kind of sustainable food or just, you know, a shifting path into something that maybe you would never have considered before you experienced this. 
Yeah, and I, and I think that is definitely right. You know, I I can't say I wouldn't be, I would never get to this point um, if I was never, you know, shown this farm at Clark, but I can definitely say I wouldn't be here today. Um, and it, you know, it would have taken me a longer route to get to something I really love. Yeah, and I mean, in the future, like in a few years or five years when the kids that are in high school right now are graduating, like I can only imagine how gratifying it's going to be for you to see them go on to, you know, become farmers or be involved in this industry and kind of knowing that you inspired them or made a positive change. Yeah. And for us, it, you know, whether they become farmers or not, it's more, you know, we, we really talk a lot internally about um, trying to increase food consciousness, which to us is just the mm -hmm. idea of, you know, knowing where your food's coming from, who touched it, um, how it got to your plate and asking those questions. And, yeah. you know, if we, you know, we really hope that we can, you know, lead students to ask these questions where they can go home and say, hey, you know, where did this food come from? Um, and then it's a, more of a community challenge than just a school challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Something that can make a positive impact and move, move in a, you know, more sustainable direction. That's great. And I'm just curious, what is, what kind of future do you envision for Touch Table in the coming months or years? Are you trying to really expand your customer base or focus in on developing curriculums? Yeah, um, so we're, we're kind of doing both at the same time. We're excited actually, we're gonna be rolling out our educational program into a few um, special education classrooms at local high schools in the next few months. And you know, for us, we, we really would wanna continue to build strong, sustainable, resilient community partnerships. And you know, we're, uh -huh. we really believe in collaboration um, and community partnership as a way to you know move through this climate change world and so that you know we're yeah. looking to to continue to build those and to deepen those relationships yeah absolutely and you know talking about the future um especially the more recent um you know upcoming future you really can't avoid conversations about the pandemic and kind of how that may affect or postpone certain plans it seems like you're still moving forward with a lot of the projects that you had lined up um, beforehand but are there any major ways that the pandemic has affected your business you know i i think it's affected kind of you know everyone's business i'm sure um but for us we've had to put put some projects on hold and you know give give groups instructions on how to turn off their garden basically um mm -hmm. and, and it's you know, kind of led us to focus more on wholesale distribution and restaurant distribution. Um, mm -hmm. You know, which is something that initially wasn't wasn't on our radar as a as a main focus, but has become. And it's something that you know we we found a lot of a lot of great reception there and built some nice relationships that we didn't really expect. Um, so, yeah. so as a silver lining, you know, that that has been kind of nice. Uh, something that's come out of the situation. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, you know, we've tried to catch up with a lot of our farmers as the pandemic has kind of unfolded over the past few months, especially a lot of them work with restaurants and, you know, there's, they've had to shift a lot, but it seems like, and including you, there's been kind of this ability to shift and kind of think outside the box and explore new possibilities that are actually paying back pretty well. Um, it seems like with the wholesale distribution, that's a really great example. Yeah, for sure. And you know, we're we've talked a lot internally about coming up with a direct to consumer model. You know, at some point, if this, you know, just just as as things evolve. So we're, mm -hmm. we're open to being flexible throughout it, for sure. Yeah, and I I really love that you're doing digital farm tours. I think that's really great, um, especially. I'm sure for kids that are stuck at home, um, just something to break up their day to day and see something pretty cool on their screens Definitely. is exciting. Yeah, and when you turn on the lights in that farm, um, kids get yeah. students get pretty excited. Yeah, something about those purple lights just I think they just make everyone happy. I, I'm sure there's science behind it, but we we always hear that the lights are just a magnet. Um, sure. And 
Yeah, and just as we wrap up um, before we go to the q and I'm just curious, like, what your thoughts are on how the pandemic has just changed people's perception about the importance of local food and sustainable food in general. Yeah, I mean, you know, for, for us, we, we think that it's actually kind of raised our collective consciousness about food. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we do kind of see this, you know, as many people beginning to question where their food came from, how it's handled, how it's produced. And we do feel we're, we're kind of at, at an, you know, we have an unprecedented opportunity here. We can rethink how we shape out food, how, reshape how we think about food and more, move more towards, mm -hmm. you know, a diversified system that focuses on community-based solutions and sustainable practices and local farms, um, particularly as, you know, we shift into a climate change world, you know, the, these solutions become more and more necessary and these type of collab collaborations um, are almost essential for communities. Awesome. All right, thank you so much, Jack. I, I've i loved this conversation. I hope our listeners have loved it too. And I'm just seeing here, we've gotten a lot of really interesting questions that I'd love to move into um, for about last 10 minutes of our webinar today. So, Let's see. Um, I'm going to start with a question that we actually got from Instagram leading up to this webinar. And I think it's a great question. What do you, what does food justice mean to you? That's a, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, for me, you know, food justice um, is about access, um, equitability, and you know, per, per helping to serve communities that may not have that access. Um, mm -hmm. and, and really, you know, that that's kind of where we've looked at schools as, you know, everyone can get the same lunch at a school. And so there's a really level playing field. Um, and, you know, that's where we see equitable access. And so if you put, for us, if we put healthy food in that school and teach kids where it's coming from, there's more like, you know, more, they're more likely to be trying that food. Um, mm -hmm. So so that's, you know, kind of how, you know, we think we play a role in, in the food justice movement. Great. and. Um, this is kind of a compound question, but I guess a lot of people have been asking. Um, so how many units do you have? Which industry do you sell the most of your produce to? And are you finding that you need to expand? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently we have one freight farm, um, but that's not our plan. Our plan is definitely to expand. Uh, we're, we're Right now we're selling mostly um, wholesale and there are some schools that are still distributing um, to families. And so we've been doing, mm -hmm. you know, limited, uh, limited, you know, half harvest to some schools, uh, some local schools in the area. But yeah, we, we have one freight farm right now. Um, and that's definitely something that we're looking to expand upon. Great. And I have another question here that a lot of people have been asking, which is, are you willing to share your feasibility and business plan in more detail? Um, and if you say yes, we can collaborate offline and maybe create some content on the web, unless you want to go into it here um, in a few minutes. Yeah, I mean, we'd be happy to, um, and, and I'd be happy to kind of have that conversation um, with anyone who would like to as well. I um, mean, you know, you and mm -hmm. I can work together to, to build something that can help some people who are listening. We'd be happy to do that. Yeah, um, and for those of you who are listening and are interested, um, the Freight Farms team is happy to connect you to Jack uh, after this webinar if you have um, more specific pointed questions so definitely reach out to us and we'll we'll uh, pass it along or you know uh, you can find Town to Table on social media um, all the usual platforms as well so another question is how did you develop your teaching curriculum yeah that's a great question. Um, so actually one of our team members uh, studied education at Skidmore College. So he was kind mm -hmm. of, he's kind of been a, been a pillar in there and that for us, but we've also tied in a lot of teachers, former teachers of ours, um, you know, family friends who teach and basically just said, Hey, will you look at our curriculum that we built and, you know, take all their feedback, sit with them, go over, you know, certain lessons, how to build out, you know, this more interactive. Um, and then what we also do is we, we show our curriculum to, our, our potential partners and we let them kind of give us feedback and that's where we talk about the curriculum iteration so for example one group said to us hey can you build a few more visual lessons and so you know in a week mm -hmm. or two we came back to them with a number of you know lessons for visual learners 
Um, so it's something that you know we we we're flexible in, um, and we you know do outsource and work with a lot of teachers in the area to help build our curriculum. I think that's great. I think um, overall, just using as many resources as you can lay your hands on is always the best way to just move move forward and get better and better with each time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we talk to we talk to anyone and everyone who will talk to us, um, and we're we're happy yeah. to you know share our story and and you know take take feedback and input. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, if I if I were starting a business, um, I would definitely follow your approach of just like being curious and open and asking questions and, um, you know, trying to forge connections because you never know when the inspiration will come, where the inspiration will come from or where your next business will come from unless you really sure. go out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And one question is, did you open both tracks at the same time or did you um, develop the educational arm later? Yeah, so we actually developed the educational arm first. Um, where we, we rolled out a few projects with some groups um, with, with smaller scale gardens. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, we followed that up with a freight farm. Great. And another question is, let's see, um, what were financiers focused on when they agreed to finance you? That's a great question. Um, so they, so our model is basically to contract out our food and so mm -hmm. they wanted to see basically a letter of intent or a letter of support from, you know, a food service director who was willing to buy either the majority or all of our produce mm -hmm. um, and, and linking them with a local food service director who was, uh, who was really, really supportive of us was, was great for us. And then, you know, that, that kind of let our financiers become confident in, in what we were able to do. Yeah. Um, this is a great question. Um, what advice would you give yourself when you just started your own farm? Wow, that is a really great question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say plan, plan, and plan some more. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can't you, you can't plan too much, but at the same time, you know, you don't want to be stuck too stuck to that plan because things do change. Um, and then on top of that, for those of you who have freight farms and who are considering getting one stay on top of the maintenance. You don't want to, you don't want to get behind there. Yeah, definitely. Cause it's, you're, it's like playing with a handicap. You're, you're only just making it more difficult. Um, yeah. And if, when you if have you, to also worry about the farm. For sure. If it's part of your weekly routine, you know, like the, it's, it's not much maintenance and cleaning. If you wait a number of months yeah. before looking in that little spot in the back of your farm, it might be dirty. Yeah. <laughs> I like that, the pro, the proactive approach for sure. Um, here's another really great question um, attached to a comment. So I'll just read the whole thing. I like how you talk about how COVID has shifted our collective consciousness regarding food sustainability. And the question is, could you talk about how underserved communities can leverage urban farming and local supply chains to service food deserts? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, you know. We, we found there's a lot of resources, particularly in Massachusetts and New England, to try to you know, jumpstart these type of programs. And with Freight Farms mm -hmm. being a Boston based company, you know, we're right here. There is there are a lot of examples that you can kind of tie to. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I would suggest, you know, looking, looking at government funding, grant opportunities, um, local grants, USDA grants, and then use local projects as examples for that. Um, and then also, you know, tie, tie us in um, and we're, we're happy to to kind of show what type of value this can bring to a community, um, the amount of produce it can bring to a community and, you know, really just the overall impact it could have. Great. And I think we're going to make that our last question. Is there anything you'd like to add, uh, Jack, before we tie things up? Uh, no, I, I really appreciate you all having me on, and I, I thank everyone who took the time to listen today. And if you you know have any questions or comments or would just like to chat, feel free to reach out to our team. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, like I said, this has been recorded, and we'll be able to share that recording with you shortly. 
Um, and definitely check out Township Table. Like I said, they're on Facebook, Instagram. They're doing awesome things. Uh, give them a follow to kind of stay involved with all of their awesome projects.